Now, in our last lessons, we examined two uh, important ideas. First of all, uh, the core idea of the Christian religion for which Abraham was a type, and that is that we are saved by faith in God. In other words, the process of salvation based on faith. Uh, the features of God-man relationship, faith, grace, failure, trust, progress, obedience, all these things are part of the, uh, the faith relationship that we have with uh, God. Also that faith in God is expressed in a lifelong relationship that includes trust and obedience and, and hope. Now within this second idea we saw that because of His grace God allows for our failures within that lifelong relationship. That's the wonderful thing about it. We're under grace, that whole idea of being under grace. We're saved uh, by a process of faith, a, a long process of faith, if you wish, a lifetime process of faith, which allows for uh, and understands uh, the weakness of man. It's not that, uh, you know, I said that it's not that God overlooks our failures or doesn't care about our failings, our sins. It's that He understands about human weakness and has provided for human weakness, human sin, through the cross of Jesus Christ. Not that God ignores sin. He, he deals with sin, but He deals with it through a process of forgiveness rather than a judgment. So in Abraham's case, we see not only failure, but also we see trust, and we see progress, and we see obedience, because these are also features that are part of our lifelong relationship with God. Let's face it, if our lifelong relationship with God um, demanded only perfect obedience, we, we wouldn't be in that relationship for very long. Because you know, we, we want to obey and we do, and we try to do God's will, but there are times that we don't. And so God has foreseen this and allows for this in a relationship. So the trust that we have is trust in that He um, Abraham rather, that Abraham relied on God to help him defeat the northern kings. You know, in other words, in this lifelong relationship there exists trust and in Abraham's case he trusted God to help him uh, overcome and defeat these uh, kings in battle uh, where he was uh, outnumbered. Also we saw progress in um, Abraham's life, in his faith relationship with God, progress in that he re refused the money and the gifts from the kings you know, that he fought with and gave honor to God instead, which he didn't do in Egypt. In Egypt he just took the spoils, he took the gifts, everything, didn't give uh, God the glory. And we also see obedience in that when God told him to circumcise himself, to uh, circumcise his household, he obeyed God exactly according to his word. So what I'm trying to say is in this faith relationship, uh, God makes room for obedience and for failure, but we do see the growth of obedience. We do see progress uh, in uh, Abraham's life in his relationship with God. Now we also looked at the significance of circumcision for Abraham and the Jews in later years. We said it was a sign of the transfer of the seed of promise from one generation to uh, another through the sexual union uh, we see one generation being replaced and that's the way the promise is handed down from one generation to another. Circumcision is always a, a sign of that promise being transferred. Also the word circumcision to cut around, meaning uh, uh, another meaning if you wish, significance is the enclosure of God's will and also a sign of parental and conjugal and personal, personal faith. The idea was that um, the Jewish man would always be aware of his relationship with God because of the marking in his flesh. Also a sign of sanctification, you know, separateness or holiness. And then finally we compared circumcision to baptism and we studied how it was a, remember that word, it was a type, right? A preview, a billboard of what was to come. Um, baptism, for example, is our response of faith. Uh, baptism is a sign that identifies believers. Uh, baptism is also a necessary uh, uh, action to be a, a part of the promise, very much like uh, circumcision was for the Jews. So in the next two chapters, we're going to get away from 
ideas, because we've talked a lot about ideas and types and so on and so forth. We're going to get away from that. And the story is going to describe not only Abraham's continuing journey, but also the results of Lot's choice, because Lot's another important character uh, in, this, um, in this phase of history. We're going to look at the choices that Lot has made and the results of that, and also a, com a comparison. You know, the progress that Abraham made and the progress that Lot made. So we go to chapter 18. I'm not going to read the first couple of verses here for the moment. Just want to kind of you know, summarize it for you. In chapter 18, Abraham is visited by what seemed to him uh, to be three men. Now the Bible says that one of them was the Lord, and this can mean that the Lord appeared as a man to Abraham. Uh, we know that God appeared to Moses as a burning bush. Uh, he appeared to Elijah as a, a wind. Uh, why can't God appear as a man? You know, that's, uh, it's nothing too hard for, for God. The difference between this and the appearance as Jesus, however, is that in this case, He simply appears in the form of a man for a time, like angels do, right? Angels appear in the form of of men. Never see angels appearing in the form of women or children in the Bible, always appearing in the form of men. In the case of Jesus, uh, um, uh, uh, he was actually born from a woman and naturally grows up as a man. So I, I want to make the difference between his, uh, you know, his appearance here as a man to Abraham and coming into the world and being born as a man with a divine nature and growing up, so on and so forth. Not exactly the same thing. Uh, Jesus was not a, 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 in appearance. He was actually a man at that time. So the Bible doesn't spend a lot of time uh, on this. It merely states it. What's important is the reason for this visit to Abra Abraham. So the purpose of the visit is to announce to Abraham that Sarah would herself conceive the child that had been promised by God. Now upon hearing this, it says that Sarah laughed within herself in verse 12 of this uh, chapter 18. It says, Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have become old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also? So, so her laugh was actually cynical. It wasn't a joyful laughter. Oh wow, ha, what a wonderful thing. You know, I'm going to have a child. It was more cynical because she doubted that in her advanced age and in her advanced condition she could ever you know, enjoy sex, let alone you know, have children. So the Lord helps her faith in an admonishing way by showing her that He knows her heart and by reassuring her that what seems impossible for her is not too difficult for Him. So we read in the following verses, and the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Okay? So, so uh, the Lord confirms, you know, he, he knows what Sarah was thinking. He even you know, puts it into words, the words that she was thinking. Uh, in a way, it's, it's a rebuke, is it? It's, it's an admonishment, right? Calling her on what she actually did. But in another way, it builds her faith because it says to her, look, if I, can, if I know what you're thinking, if I know what your heart is thinking, that, having that power shouldn't Shouldn't that power also be respected in the, in the sense that you know, if I say you're going to be pregnant, then that's going to happen as well. You know, if I can do one thing, surely I can do another. If God can do one, He can do another. So they don't belabor this point, but it, it's, this is the point where the promise is announced, you know, uh, or actually the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham and Sarah is announced. So upon their departure, Abraham learns of the second reason for these men's visit, and that was uh, to announce the judgment of the city of Sodom. Now Sodom was to be judged for its wickedness, not only in conduct, but in refusing the witness that the Lord had sent them. You know, Abraham had saved them from the northern kings. Remember, you know, the, 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 uh, the attack by the northern kings had been in the valley there, and Sodom was one of the cities that was overrun, and a lot of people were taken captive, including Lot. So there was one witness for them. 
then Melchizedek had lived righteously before them. He was a priest of the Most High God. He was known among them. And then Lot had dwelled as a righteous man among them, and yet they were still wicked. So it's not as if they didn't have um, you know, a, witness for what, um, a witness for what was taking place. So Abraham, Abraham learns of this intention and he intercedes once again for the people and especially for his nephew, for his nephew Lot. And so we read about Ab Abraham's intercession. If you skip down to verse um, 23, we'll read that uh, prayer that he makes. It says, Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? For uh, far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all earth deal justly? So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. And Abraham replied, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the 50 righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city because of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. He spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose 40 are found there. And he said, I will not do it on account of 40. Then he said, oh, may the Lord not be angry and I shall speak. Suppose 30 are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he says, now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of 20. Then he said, oh, may the Lord not be angry and I shall speak only this once. Suppose 10 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the 10. As soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed and Abraham returned to his place. So Abraham's intercession on behalf of the cities of the plain, including Sodom, had interesting aspects. First of all, it was the first model of intercessory, uh, intercessory prayer. Uh, uh, the first time we see a prayer um, spoken by someone interceding for someone else in the Bible. So an interesting instance of this uh, model of intercession that we see first time in the Bible. Secondly, um, it acknowledges that God is both merciful and just and counts on this. In other words, Abraham counts on the fact that God, yes, he'll bring justice, but he mixes his justice with mercy as well. And he counts on this knowledge of God to appeal for uh, the saving of the city if at least 10 are found there. And then thirdly, uh, Abraham, Abraham asked God to spare the cities if 10 righteous people were found. Interesting to note, that's the exact number in Lot's family. There was Lot and his wife, that's two. He had two sons. He had two married daughters, two sons-in-law, and two unmarried daughter, so you have, you have 10. So in the end, of course, we know only four were willing to leave and the city thus was destroyed. So when the Lord agrees to his prayer, Abraham goes back home and the scene now shifts to Sodom. So let's take a look at what happens in Sodom. Let's read verse one in chapter 19. It says, now the two angels came to Sodom. Notice now the Lord has left they were the three. Now, so, so we get the understanding that one is the Lord and two are angels. So anyways, two angels come to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Now, the idea here of seeing Lot at the gate of the city, this doesn't mean that uh, he was a vagrant with nothing to do. You know, he wasn't people watching at the gate of the city. The gate was where the city council held their meetings. Uh, it was where the marketplace was. It was the center of trade and culture for the city. And to sit there means you were involved in the life of that city in some way. The Bible says that Lot was a righteous man and that his soul was vexed because of the wickedness of that city. It doesn't say it here in Genesis, but later in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, Peter says that about Lot, he, he, he was, he was vexed, vexed, he was troubled 
because he was a righteous man living in a very unrighteous place. He was a godly man living in an ungodly place. Remember, however, it, it was of his own choosing, nobody forced him, he chose to live there. He had witnessed the same call as Abraham, but he wanted to belong to this world, I believe, more than he wanted to belong to the next. So let's keep reading, it says, and he said, now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet, then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, no, but we shall spend the night in the, uh, in the square. Uh, yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. So for various reasons, of course, he knew the town was evil, and also it was the custom of the times, and also he recognized them as special people. I mean, he offered them worship. He knew there was something very special about them. For all of these reasons, Lot invites them to his house. Now, as was the custom, they refuse his invitation at first, but then they accept it. You know, we do that today too, don't we? You know, hey, uh, come on over to our house for supper. Oh, no, 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 we wouldn't impose on you. No, no, it's quite all right. Come on, you know, it's the same idea, same thing going on going on here. So another interesting feature you kind of pick up here is that Lot is preparing the meal himself, which in that culture you know, was quite unusual, should have been his wife preparing the meal. So this may suggest that his wife was less hospitable uh, than he. This is also the first mention of leaven in the Bible, and it is usually related to corrupting influences when it's mentioned, except when Jesus uses the term to refer to the kingdom. So let's keep reading. It says, before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter, and they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand aside. Furthermore they, said, this one, uh, furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien, and already he is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. And so the following passage describes how a mob is formed outside the house in the evening, demanding that, the, that Lot turn over the men so that they could, in this Bible, New American Standard, it says, have relations with them. But in the King James and other versions, it says, so that we may, so that we may know them. Uh, so they become infuriated when he refused. They even turn on him by accusing him of being a foreigner and you know, not really being one of them. You know, you're from out of town, you're not really one of us. You know, who do you think you are? That type of thing. You know, you're judging us. You know, who made you judge over us? You know, this, this is the kind of attitude. Now, again, as I said, in my uh, version of the Bible here, New American, New American Standard, the New American Standard uses the term, you know, the men said, we want to have relations with the guests there. Um, the, some other versions say uh, to know them, and I want to comment on that. That word know is, no, K-N-O-W, that word know is used elsewhere in the Old Testament to describe sexual relations. So that's what the mob wanted to do. They wanted to rape them. Uh, the New American Standard says, have relations with them, a little more accurate, uh, uh, a little more accurate and modern uh, translation into the English. Now, I make a little aside here, a little you know, parenthetical statement. Homosexual scholars, and there are homosexuals who are Bible scholars, and um, I, I don't want to say all of them I, because I don't know, but most of them 
Um, uh, usually uh, in these passages and passages that deal with homosexuality, same sex type of activity, usually find a way to defend or diffuse what the Bible says about this thing. So many homosexual scholars say that this passage means that the people just wanted to get to know in a social way, you know, we just want to have a relations with them, you know, we want to get to know them. Uh, in a social way, as a way of defending homosexual practices, as a way of saying the Bible doesn't really condemn that type of activity. But um, the following passages and the way the word no is used elsewhere in the Bible uh, uh, disproves this, uh, this transparent effort you know, to, uh, uh, to kind of gloss over what is really happening here. Other scholars tell us that Male rape and sodomy was also one way to show dominance and victory over an enemy. So the mob may have wanted to have sex not just for pleasure, but to humiliate and dominate these foreigners and intimidate others who would kind of come to town and you know, trying to do the same thing. So, so Lot offers his virgin daughters to be raped instead of his guests. He may have recognized their true nature and wanted to save the town and the angels from disgrace. I mean, if he, if he recognized that there were angels, he also knew that any attempt against them like this would be a disaster for the, for the town. Um, the sacrifice of his daughter showed that even though he, you know, he brought a lot of this trouble upon himself, he was sensitive to spiritual things and he was willing to make a sacrifice to maintain uh, righteousness, especially in regard to his guests. This action you know, probably saved him. You know, had, he, had he said, well, go ahead and take them, uh, you know, and he'd be afraid, uh, he would have been destroyed right along with the city. So we see what the Bible says, the angels blind the mob and they save Lot and his daughter. So let's keep reading the story here, verse 12 to 14. It says, then the two men said to Lot, whom else have you here? a son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place for we are about to destroy this place because of their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. So here, you know, this is one of the saddest scenes of the Old Testament. Lot, a righteous man who has compromised with the world, not able to save his own family because his compromise has rendered him morally useless in witnessing to his own children. They don't see the difference because he's compromised with the world so much. You know, his children saw him as part of the world, they, they didn't see him making a stand before, they saw him compromising. So when he does make a stand, they don't take him seriously. You know, sometimes this is the reason why we feel powerless to guide our own children, because we haven't made a stand, we haven't, you know, we haven't really uh, sacrificed for righteousness sake. And so when we make an attempt to do it for ourselves, our children don't, our children don't take us uh, Seriously. So the story continues, verse 15. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him, and they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, one said, escape for your life, do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, oh no, my lords. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains for the disaster will overtake me and I will die now. Behold, and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please let me escape there. Is it not small that my life may be saved? And he said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the town was called Zoar. 
the sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. So you know, the angels are ready to destroy the cities and telling Lot and his wife and two daughters to leave. And isn't that amazing? I mean, Lot appeals to them to save one of the cities called Zoar because it's small. Not, not, he didn't say it's righteous. He didn't say, look, let me go there because that's a righteous city and these are good people, they're believers, God-fearing people, let me get, no. He just says, well, it's a small city, you know, small sin, you know, that type of thing. It can't, it can't hurt a lot. And so uh, the angels, um, uh, the angels uh, you know, give him permission to, uh, to, uh, to do that. Uh, he didn't want to travel and live in the mountains like Abraham because he didn't think he would survive. He was righteous, but his faith was very weak in the Lord. Even at this point, he's compromising, but God has mercy on him nevertheless. So verse 24, 29 says, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground. But his wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley and he saw and behold the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. So after their departure, uh, the cities themselves are destroyed by fire and brimstone that rained down upon him. You know, there, there are several things that could have happened here. Uh, a totally supernaturally generated fire sent from heaven to destroy the city. God could have done it that way. Uh, it could be a divinely timed volcanic eruption that destroyed them. There's evidence of volcanic activity in this uh, region. Could have also been a divinely timed earthquake that distributed hydrocarbons and sulfur into the atmosphere that may have been ignited by a lightning storm creating a devastating uh, fire from the sky. In other words, God simply from things that are not seen creates the fire and the destructive force that kills the city or He uses the natural elements that He has created already that are seen and manipulates them in such a way that creates the, the disaster. In any case, in any case, God was able to produce any of these and the Bible records that the cities in that area were destroyed. In addition to this, Lot's wife perished as she disobeyed the angel's instructions and she looked back. Now the term here used suggests that she looked back, not just you know, a glimpse back, oh, is the fire getting to me? She looked back longingly at the world that she was leaving behind. Perhaps she immediately turned to salt while looking back. Perhaps she hesitated and lingered and was overtaken by the fire and smoke and ash and eventually her remains became a pillar of salt like, uh, like the, exists in that region even to this day. Either way, her worldliness finally got the best of her because she just couldn't give up the sinfulness of Sodom. And, and, and her slow departure from it finally destroyed her. You know, sometimes being too slow to let go sin, being too slow to let go worldliness, too slow to let go you know, compromising things can destroy us as well. Today, a marvelous lesson here. Today was the day of salvation for her and she waited and lingered too long. Now in verse 30 to 38, the final narrative describing Lot's situation. After his escape from Sodom, he sees that going to the mountains is the safest idea. He doesn't go to Zoar. So he goes you know, with his two remaining unmarried daughters, they go to the mountains. His wife is dead, as well as most of his family. His possessions are gone, as well as his home. He's now living in a cave. Now God spared Lot's life because of Abraham and also in his heart he was righteous, but he suffers loss because he compromised with the world. 
His two daughters we read about are afraid of being alone without help, without descendants, without husbands. So they get him drunk, they get Lot drunk. Notice again, you know, in the Bible, if you count the number of times you know, alcohol is mentioned, you'll see that more than, you know, the, the, the majority of the times it's mentioned in negative terms. There are sometimes it's mentioned in positive terms, but most of the times mentioned in negative terms. So they get him drunk and they conceive by having relations with him while he is drunk, half asleep. This was not the sin that it was, that it was to be later on in Moses' time where there were admonitions against you know, brother and sister marrying, uncles, fathers, daughters, that type of thing. But still they realized that Lot would not have agreed to it. It, it showed not so much that they were sexually immoral, but rather that they had little faith in God to provide for them. Again, the daughters of little faith. You know, they didn't have faith. They, the faith of Lot did not transfer that well to their daughters. The mother obviously did not have a strong faith uh, or else she would not have uh, lingered. So anyways, the chapter ends describing the results of this union. Moab, one child is born, Moab, from the fa which means from the father, uh, became a great nation living in the mountainous regions, often at war with the Israelites, you know, Moab, the Moabites, Ruth in the Bible, the story of Ruth, she was a Moabite, she comes from here. Uh, and then Benamni, uh, or, or Benami rather, uh, the other child born, uh, son of my people, that's what that word means, was also uh, born and he became the father of the Ammonites, the Ammonites. So Lot, you know, he had great opportunities, great blessings, and the Bible says he was righteous, but his weakness in compromise with the world led to the loss of his home, the destruction of most of his family, uh, and uh, his, uh, his life. So there are a couple of lessons here that I want to share with you before we uh, finish this particular uh, session. Lesson number one, of course, be ready. You know, the Lord visited both Abraham and Lot and each was in a different state of readiness. Abraham was waiting, anticipating the coming and God blessed him and Sarah and, and heard his prayer. On the other hand, Lot was enjoying the world, trying to fit into it, and his compromising nearly cost him his life. It's not just the end of the world. The Lord can visit you with a blessing or a test at any time, and you need to be ready. And you need to be aware that this may happen to you. you know, Jesus said that we need to be ready. You, know, you don't know when the Lord comes, you know, those parables. Uh, and, and he's talking about when the Lord comes for judgment, when the Lord returns, so on and so forth. But also another application of this is we need to be ready for the tests that we have in life, for the temptations that come our way in life, for the successes that we have and the failures that we have. We have to be ready for these things. Abraham was ready when his time came. Lot was uh, not ready when his time came. Second lesson here, nothing is too difficult for God. Sarah was past childbearing age, Lot lost everything, the daughters of Lot saw no hope, no future for themselves. They forgot or they doubted that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing is too hard for Him. So we need to be able to take impossible things or those things that look impossible and give them up in prayer to God for whom nothing is impossible. And that should, be, that should be part of our prayer, saying to God, you know, Lord, I know nothing is impossible. I can't see how this is going to get done. I don't understand. I don't have the resources. But you do. You understand. You know these things. You know, that, that's a prayer of faith. Third lesson, uh, mercy and justice, a combination of mercy and justice. We need to always keep in mind that God is a God of mercy and justice, not just patience and understanding and forgiveness from Him, but also judgment and punishment and reckoning. There's a mixture of both in God's attitude towards us. So it's okay to depend on God for mercy, but it's not okay to presume on it, because God's justice will judge the hypocrites and the unfaithful and the unbelievers. Okay, one more lesson um, from our section, and that is, of course, don't look back. Lot's wife is the perfect example of what happens to those who love the world and they hate leaving it. She believed, she understood, 
her feet were heading towards the safety of the mountains, but her heart was still in Sodom. So God judges us not for where our feet are, He judges us for where our hearts are. Where your heart is, the Lord says, that's where your treasure is, and that's where your judgment will be as well. So let's remember that idea as we go forward. All right, so that's all we've got for this week. We're going to continue with this story in our next session. Thank you very much and God bless you.